All right, folks, we're going to get rolling to make sure that we have ample time for these guys to talk. Uh, when it comes to meat management, you're not going to find better resources than these two. Uh, so I'm not going to even talk any more than that. I'm going to pass it right off to you guys and let you guys do your thing. So thank you all for coming to this first session. Well, thank you very much. Um, on that screen, I'm the one that gives Scott Stallman. This is Greg Dutek. Um, we, this presentation is to assist you uh, with maybe some meat management kinds of issues, uh, an update of any of the new rule changes, uh, that kind of thing. And um, when you see this first slide, what was asked of us, and we, we confront this many times. Yeah. Um, as, as officials, uh, a coach would say, now, uh, this, this is this type of competition. Are you, are you really going to enforce this particular rule? <laughs> well, yeah, we are. Because there are rules of track and field. And we need to protect the integrity of the sport that we all love so much. You need to be cognizant of the rules and what applies to what type, how we apply that to, uh, I think, as you start to host competitions, is it a JV meet? Is this a championship? My statement, Greg knows this, May 1st comes along, now we are in championship month. And it's really maybe different than the way that we treat those first meets in <coughs> April when it's cold and crappy outside. And, and we go through, and it's a lot of learning for all of us as coaches, athletes, officials as well. But you come to May 1st, and everything changes. Because in May, in May, everything has kind of this championship feel, whether it's your section true team meet, whether it's your conference meet, you move to the end of the month and all of a sudden it's your section meet and all of those kinds of things. And, yeah, rules matter. Uh, Tony Anderson uh, talked to me maybe two years ago um, at a, a Friday meet at the University of Minnesota in the winter. He said, hey, I just came from our coach's clinic and people were asking if maybe we could have a session sometime on this kind of thing. In fact, Scott and I are leaving from here to go to that meet at the, today at the U. And I said, just tell us what you want and, and we'll try. So Johnny sent me an email uh, in December saying that we're looking at the role of officials and how we as coaches can get our athletes ready for the championship season when they come into contact with officials that are going to enforce the rules. Because the reality is, and I coached and Scott coached, a lot of times who's running an event for you? It's the coaches. Or it's a parent who said, I used to run track, I think I can do the long jump for you. Or it's somebody who found that, in fact, you've trained and they know how to do a good job and all of that without maybe knowing all the nuances. Um, and he also asked what any new rules entail uh, that have come from the Federation this year. And then how can we get our athletes ready? How can we get them uh, from our standpoint to know so that when they get to a section meet and it's the first time all year that they haven't been allowed to talk to me in the infield before their race because coaches aren't allowed on the infield at the section meet or at state. How do we get ready for that? And so we'll try to kind of walk our way through all of that. Obviously, pop your hand up if you've got a question comment, any of those kinds of things. Um, we'd love to, uh, to have a dialogue going. <coughs> so one of the things that uh, we were talking about as we uh, were planning uh, what to do uh, is that when people go to a meet, or, or anything actually, um, I was thinking about it in terms of Christmas. I could buy my kids the greatest gifts in the world, but if it wasn't on their list, they're not happy because they didn't get what they expected. If you go to a meet and you're expecting something to be done in a certain way and it's done differently, it may be done really well and you still aren't feeling quite the love because it's not what you expected. 
Athletes obviously expect to be able to compete in their events and have things done in a fair way. Have you ever been to a meet where there's 10 heats of the 200 because you got every JV running it as well? Of course. You know what? That 80th kid in lane eight of the last heat expects to be given the same amount of time to set his blocks as the kids that were the studs in the first heat. And they expect the starter to give them the same attention. Coaches want meets that run smoothly. They, they don't want delays. They don't want problems with the timing system. They don't want all those kinds of things. And they want to know what the meet procedures are ahead of time. How are we doing things? Are we running the fast kids first or the fast kids last? Let's get that figured out ahead of time so we know where to place our kids. Athletes and coaches do expect officials to know the rule. A lot of times one of the things that happens is kids are told different things at different meets about anything as innocuous as where, whether they can wear a hat to uh, whether they can run backwards on a runway to warm up. Your officials that you hire expect that meets are gonna follow the rules. Uh, a fellow official of ours, Dick Eldridge, who passed away a few years ago, was a terrific football official. And he used to say that he never ever had a coach ask him before a game if they were gonna call offside or if tonight they were gonna be a little loose on the pass interference. From the first game of the season to the last. They expect to use the procedures that have been communicated. If the first I hear of how you wanna do something at a meet is when I get there to set up, that's maybe a little bit late in terms of me being prepared with the stuff I'm gonna to bring to help you. It's all about communication. We expect that the facilities and materials are ready and functional. So when we come, you know, the pits are set up. They're at the right spot. All those kinds of things are, are done and, and ready to go. Starting blocks have spikes in them that will hold without block holders. Because block holders are an option that only the starters have the ability to say can be used. Should never assume that. So, <laughs> just a couple of questions. Did you know the high school book is the most liberal rule book of all the rule books in track and field? It's the one that has the most opportunities for you to tailor a meet to your needs. Did you know that you're supposed to score every meet that you're in? If you've got the FAT and you're in your uniforms and there's multiple schools at the meet, you keep a team score. It's the rules. Did you know that whenever you're running timed finals, not prelims and finals, but just comparing the times, the fast heat is supposed to be the last one. So that those kids know what they have to be in the rules. We just mentioned the starting block one. This one is catching people more and more. All athletes in a field event are to be checked in before the first attempt is made by the first athlete in the event. You might be in the fourth flight out of four. You're still supposed to be checked in ahead of time. Nope, athletes, athletes. And, and the reason for that is we need to know that the athlete's on site. And because the referees and the games committee and so on and so forth, what if a third of the athletes don't show up? We're not gonna keep them in four flights anymore. We're gonna squeeze them down to three. We're gonna be able to make those moves. Or what if all the kids who are missing are from the first flight? All of a sudden the second flight is the first flight. So. Get there, go over, <laughs> check in, done. And I think what Greg has highlighted so far, the, keys, the key one word that he stated, communication. If you're going to have <coughs> JV triangular, <coughs> and you've got these two schools coming to your place, you probably
probably haven't assembled a games committee to go over all the, but you have an idea of what you're going to do for that meet. It's unlimited entry. State that in a document. We are going to do cafeteria style in the long, in the triple jump. We're going to do it from 4 until 5.30. They get four attempts, but at 5.30, we're going to cut it off and we're going to start the next horizontal jump. After a one half hour, state it. Make it's not hard. State all the things that you intend to do for that competition. Now, if if Greg and I are hosting a, a conference meet, we have got these documents, then it's got everything in there that you would like to know, plus things you probably have never heard of. And it gives the responsibilities of the host school and the athletic director of the host school, and, and you've got all the all the procedures down there, and Princeton is bringing one adult marker, somebody to pull the tape, two kids to groom the people. All of that is in here, a little bit different. But each one of these competitions starts with communication. And then everybody's on the same page when you walk in. And they, even telling, hey, the campsites are on the southeast corner of the track on the grassy area. Stuff like that. Park your buses in the west lot, not the east lot. We have, we have our regular school bus, whatever it is, stay in, so that there's no question. If you look at the handout that we had in the back there, um, and turn in, I think, to the third page, it should say at the top, 2024 NFHS Track and Field Rules Book, mm -hmm. and then underneath that it says Rule 3, Section 2, the Games Committee. So kind of looking at that first thing, 35 things. Take a look going down that list. It actually goes on for three pages of places where the Games Committee is mentioned in the high school rule book. Games Committee determines officials. Games Committee determines competition area. What's the competition area? It's the area for athletes and officials. So that's runways, that's the track, that's etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, the time schedule, the heats, heats and lanes, um, uh, letter G. You know, the rule book says, even if you have FAT, you're supposed to have backup. So the games committee, or the meet host, decides whether or not we have to have backup timers if we have FAT. Most of us now specify that the FAT has to have two cameras going, you know, separate from each other, and then that takes care of the backup piece. Approved items and locations and marks. I worked to meet last spring at, at a high school that said, we're tired of all the chalk because it's too hard to wash off. Okay, so the games committee for that meet said, no chalk. And they provided little colored index cards. Every kid got a color and they put a couple of thumbtacks on it next to the runway and you're the blue and you're the yellow and you're the red and every kid knew his mark and when it was all done, they just picked them all back up and it was ready for the next day. We'll use it at the same meet. It worked perfect. And uh, in fact, college now bans the use of chalk in USATF. So kids can't use it after high school. Anyway, going down, you can letter I. The method of exchanging the baton in relays not run in lanes. So that's the 4x4 four four and the 4x8. Right? It's not the starter's decision. It's not the referee's decision. It's not the course decision. It's the games committee. So if you have a way that you want that to work, you want the kids to shuffle in from the outside, or do you want kids on the inside? Do you want kids lined up all within the zone? You know, how do you want all that to go? Let us know. And then, and then go on from there. So as you read through that, you can see some of them are pretty innocuous and ones that you don't worry about, but uh, it is uh, the whole school as the games committee's job. Uh, to know those things. Um, and then there's some other places in here that talk about whether you can use a bungee or who's involved when you know you have to decide if we're going to change directions in a ball because of the wind or something like that. Those are all, there's nothing in here 
that says that it's ever a decision of the group of coaches. It always comes back to the games committee. So this is a, I, I made this document by pulling this stuff from the rule book, um, and uh, we use it uh, when we work at, at different places where we host, um, and uh, to the point where one conference I work with, the games committee members for that year's meet are required to come after practice on the first Wednesday in April to the host site, and we go through this entire list, make all those decisions, and send them to the coaches ahead of time. So it's all done, and they know how to prepare their kids and, and get them ready. It's a great idea. Right, Adam? <laughs> as, a, as a meet manager, that's what Greg does for that particular conference, and then he invites, since I'm the running referee, he invites me to come, and Kenny Freeman is the field referee, Kenny comes, and we look over that site. And as we said, you sand up to the top, I mean, so that it's a fair competition, that those kinds of things. And little things, like, gosh, I, I'm a field referee for a conference meeting that's being held at McAllister, got a great vaulter. This kid, in fact, in that meet, set the all-time 16 feet one inch. And so I'm there, I have to search. But there's a wind direction change. It's a front is coming through. And all of a sudden, I'm at the shot put, and I look over, and it's like the ants have picked up the cobalt pit, and they're marching it. Hold it, wait, stop. Time out. What are you doing? Well, the wind changed. <laughs> That's a games committee deal. You can't just decide. But the dad of this falter said, what? <laughs> no, you can stop. You can do that with the games committee approval. You can do that when there's a height change, not in the middle of those kinds of things occur. So, yeah, that's why, <laughs> and that's why we go, Oh, that's a that's in the rules. We better discuss this. <laughs> so it's sort of like recommendation one is um, really dig in and 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 learn the nuances of the rules. Um, it it's um, we're still learning every day. Uh, new stuff comes out. Old stuff comes out. Interpretations change. Um, uh, and and the idea is that. A lot of times, you'll ask us a question at a meeting, we'll say, hmm, let me, let me just kind of double check the wording in the book. That's okay. You know, it, in fact, most NFHS books for every sport require there to be a copy of the rule book at the site. And I work hockey games as an announcer, and, and I have to have a rule book at the bench so that if the referees need to come over and double check something, they, they have the ability to do that. That's okay, we want it done right. As Scott said, what, what, what's going on with your meet? You know, early in the year, later in the year. Best example that I can think of is this. He was just talking about kind of cafeteria style jumping, right? I would wager you that 90% or more of the meets that you take your kids to use that as the method of long and triple jumping. And yet when you get to the section meet, what happens? They're put in flights. They have a time when they're going to jump. There's finals later. So you have kids who've gone all season long never having more than three jumps in a meet, probably. Now all of a sudden making finals and having to come back and do three more. And it might be scheduled right at the time when they're supposed to be in the finals of the hurdles. So we haven't done the job of getting our kids ready for the championship part of the season when that happens. Maybe after May 1st, we should be using cafeteria style in our larger meets. Maybe we should be flighting kids and, and doing that kind of thing. Um, the South Suburban that I work with came up with a, a method to make that be a nice transition a couple years ago. So, Every team, there's 10 teams, every team is guaranteed three entries, so everybody gets a kid in every flight. 
And after we publish the uh, heat sheets initially, and coaches can see which heats their kids are in to like the hundred and the hurdles and all that, they can look and they place their jumpers to avoid having to check out from the jumps. So instead of them being flighted by ability or by performance, they're flighted, so the coach says, well, I want Johnny in flight one and, Mary, and Billy in flight two and Barry in flight three. They have that choice. And then we publish everything. And so we have very little issue with the check-in, check-out. It's available if it's needed, just because on the second day we don't have that ability. Um, and it's, it's worked really well as a transition to kids the next week at section and having to, to do it that way. And still, because of the rule book being liberal, and maybe you don't have a registered official that might understand this, within that flight, you still have flexibility so that uh, a kid can take consecutive jumps to facilitate a running event, or they can be changed in the order of jumping to do the very same thing, or if they're in concurrent field events, going from the long jump over to the pole vault and back, all those things can be accommodated within there. So there's all kinds of things. And if you, if maybe you have the geography teacher as that event official, you can relate that to them, give them that flexibility to allow the athlete to have the best possible. What, what, everything we do is to give the athlete the best possible opportunity. So that's the, that's the relationship between an official and the coaches and the athletes. Rule three, uh, section two, article three, letter O. The games committee has the authority to determine the time limit and procedure to follow when competitors are excused to compete in another event. How many meets have you gone to where one official says, well, you get 10 minutes. 10 minutes uh, from when? From when I check out, from when I'm done with my event, from when the event is over, from when they release me from the award stand. What is it? At a section meet that I manage, we tell them we have no time limit. What's supposed to happen is the minute you're done with your running event, you're supposed to come back. From the time we let you go, till the time you come back, unless you're going to run the two mile, shot probably be about 10 minutes. But but do I have to compete as soon as I get back? You might. That's one of the things that happens when you're in multiple events. We'll try to manipulate it so you don't have to. And what you're gonna find, you're gonna run into officials that understand the kid that just finished the 400 and the bar is now at this height. These are good people. <laughs> these, these are yeah. people that understand. Yeah, yeah can just relax. But there's nothing built in that says, uh, you, you know. Now, if you're the games committee in the whole school and you decide you want to make it 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever, go ahead. But that means we can't raise the bar or we can't move on or, or, or so on. If you're a varsity only, varsity and JV, et cetera, these things make a difference. I, I certainly, when JVs come, are not even looking at uniforms other than to be sure they have one. Um, varsity kids, yeah. I think it's important to get them to wear the stuff right, right from the beginning. One thing that you can do to help kids be ready for enforced meets is to read that page in the high school league information about what makes a legal uniform. And you as coaches, you as coaches, teach that to your kids so that we don't have smaller kids coming with a knot tied in the back of their uniform to make it smaller. Because knots aren't a lot. Pins, but knots aren't. We get this all the time in cross country or track, people asking why, but nobody can answer that. Why, why no knot? Why no knots? What's the, why did the, the I, I, I have no idea, but it's in the book. You know, yeah. and we'd have to, yeah. well, but uh, you know what? I can ask that question. I, you know, Julie Cochran, and, and I'll send her a, an email. I told her we were doing a session today. She said, let me know how it goes. Got it reached out to the state oh, yeah. high school league and, you know, national 
contract until the night have yet to get a response. Mm -hmm. I, so I suspect. It is a difficult time. I suspect that it's okay. So headbands, the tying a knot, we don't allow in Minnesota. In many states, actually don't. I suspect it has something to do with they can come loose. And uh, a knotted headband that comes loose could fly in the face of another athlete or something. I mean, stuff happens. What if that happens to a uniform on a kid who all of a sudden is embarrassed and this and that and the other? It's kind of like when the jewelry rule went away. I actually had some coaches say to me, I wish they wouldn't have done that. Because he said, very first cross country race and the earring must have come out of one of my girl's ears and she literally stopped in the middle of the course to look on it and people ran into her. When nobody could wear it, it just wasn't an issue. I'm not suggesting we go back to it, by the way. You know, my but uh, I, you know, I'll check and, and find out what the what the rationale is. It's been in the book forever. We get a lot of questions like, "My phone just went off. I'm terribly sorry. I, we should have stated no electronics. We are in the area of competition right now, <laughs> and no electronics. However, when we when we talk to kids." earbuds, phones, you know, uh, headphones around the neck, all of that kind of thing. And we say, you know, young man, young lady, that is not allowed. You are in the area of competition that is not allowed. Why? <laughs> First of all, well, they're kids. They question you as a teacher if you're a teacher. Why? Well, here it is. It's a safety thing. It is a safety thing. And I'll just relate one thing that I saw in person, up close, and it was devastating. Two kids on the infield. They had their beats around their neck, loud enough that I could hear when I'm talking with their coach. And we had this conversation, they had a question, and then they're going to walk away, and I said, hey, um, coach, what? The electronics, the thing, you're, we're standing right there. Oh yeah, kids, you're not supposed to have those on. So the, they walk away. They immediately put them on and the exit to the track went right through the high jump. The boys were in competition. Now they're listening, they have no clue what is going on in that high jump competition. And they walk across. The kid has no idea. He is concentrating at bars at 6-5, and he starts his run up and <laughs> hit the two girls. That's why there are no electronics in the area of competition. And that's, I, I saw it, I go, well, now I know the rule and why the rule exists. So, when the kid says, or my coach didn't tell me. Yeah, they did. The coach we trust that you did. <laughs> the, coach, the coach told you, but you're using the coach as your crutch because it's, it's one of those kid kinds of responses. And in all this, are kids going to make a mistake? Absolutely they're going to make a mistake. Just like we did when we were that age of learning and my God, good thing. I always say, I, I had the best coaches in the world. And they led me to this, to this day right now. One of the things that, um, that all of us, so if I'm at a meet, I'm, I'm the one that you hired. Um, one of the things I do is, is I try to get a feel for the people that are running field events, the people that are clerking, what their level of knowledge and expertise is. And yes, I, I want the rules followed, but I have to I have to bear with what I have. So for me, um, if I'm over at, let's say, um, the throws area, uh, I'm gonna want to be sure that those people, first and foremost, are thinking about safety. They're not letting kids walk out of that sector with their back to the circle to retrieve the shot. They're not letting kids stand over to the side, tossing discs in the air and trying to catch them. You know, 
those kinds of things. Um, uh, so I think that's very important. As you work with people, as you find people to work your meets, as your coaches even do that. Because it's very easy when you are coaching each day to do things in a certain way that may not be acceptable when you get to a meet. How many are not aware that at least four years ago, the rule book changed to say that athletes may not start at a board in the long jump or triple jump or pole vault and run in the reverse direction to get their steps down on a meet. We're all aware of that. It's in college, it's in USATF, it's banned everywhere. And we still have kids trying to do it. And coaches say, we do it in practice all the time. Don't practice it. People learn what they do. And if what they do every day in practice is to run out from the board, they're gonna to expect to do that at any. So your, your officials can step forward and say, you know, we know that that one isn't uh, there. We already talked about checkout, unseated versus seated, et cetera. But again, all those considerations that you make ahead of time and publish and get to the officials ahead of time are, I think, going to make your meat go better because it's not something we're learning 15 minutes beforehand at a coach's meeting or a half an hour or whatever. Some other things to think about. This one is unbelievable to me when you think about it. Think about any other sport other than maybe cross country and, and say Nordic skiing or something. They got a defined court, a defined rink, defined places where athletes and coaches can sit when they're not playing. It's, it's all limited, it's right there. What do we have? Acres. A limited number of officials. They have a limited number of officials. We have how many? You know, good section meet might have 30, 35 officials at it. Protocols for games and matches in those cases. Everybody knows what a football game looks like, and a basketball game, and a hockey game, and, and so on. There's no games committee that says, well, for this game, we're only going to have 14 minute periods. We're going to make ice halfway through. <laughs> no, it doesn't happen. It's, it's all set in stone. It doesn't have that flexibility that you have. And as a concept, and, and yet, with the massive number of officials needed to put on a meet, the state high school league only requires one of them to be registered with the league. Why is that? I think it's two things. A, gosh, you meant to have all those people. <laughs> B, there aren't that many. Yeah, um, uh, pre-pandemic, it was about 180. <coughs> uh, pandemic time, it dropped to under 100, down in the 90s. It's risen back to about 160, 160. The thing is, not everybody is willing to do everything. So some people say, I only start, or I only do the pole vault. And how many of those officials are also coaches like me? Correct. And how many of them are in your area? If you're in the metro area, you can find officials. If you're in greater Minnesota, we, we did a, uh, a thing back when I was still working and uh, um, worked with something called uh, geographic information systems where you could geocode addresses to flat maps and all of this. And, and so we had a guy take the addresses of all the officials in the state and he created a map and overlaid it on a map of counties of the state and there was a dot where every official lived. And there were counties that had no registered officials in them and no registered officials in the counties surrounding them. So a high school in that county to find a registered official would have to get somebody from two counties away to come. And many of you experienced that. It's not fun. You're, you're paying more money, you're doing all these different kinds of things just to get the one that you're required to have. So we understand that, and, and, and we know that that's one of the, the tough things, which means 
you folks bear way more responsibility than your other coaching peers in making sure that your competitions are held properly. And all we really want to do throughout the whole process is support and appreciate your efforts and do what we can to help make it work. And one of the things that Scott and I have found as former coaches and, and officials now is that the more organized that we can be, the more pieces that we do ahead of time, the fewer things we assume, the better things uh, tend to go. So, the crux of it is, what do we do to get kids ready to be officiated? I'm gonna pick on you, Adam. So, Adam uh, is at Farmington, and uh, coaching the boys, and uh, Tom Hart uh, is coaching the girls. They called me, and I came over last spring. Can you just describe what we did in the gym there? Yeah, so, um, you know, education is everything, and getting the kids to be ready for championship meets. So we asked Greg to come and just kind of, we said 15 minutes to spit all to say important things about uniform work, uh, certain things that we'd like the kids to hear. It was a great idea. I think our timing was bad that we did it early in the year, and the kids forgot it the minute they left the gym. But I think it's a great idea um, to hear it from somebody besides you. You're talking to your kids every single day, and you're giving them a lot of information, and it's yada, 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 this. Um, but having somebody that has like this aura to them, or an, a, an elected official, um, I know they take away from it a lot more seriously than when it's just your jumps coach saying this or that. And you know, we've even talked about doing it for specific events, maybe staggered throughout the year, in the future, and maybe this upcoming year. I have like a general rules meeting um, and then like for the runway and for checking out and checking in because that's such a big issue because usually your best jumper has got to check out the jumps and come back yep. and to have that happen at you know, a championship meet would be devastating. Appreciate it. Thank you for idea. sharing. Yeah. Hey, um, it would behoove you as well. Now, I, I was in on the ground floor of what was called TAC, the Athletics Congress, which then has changed their name to USA Track and Field Minnesota. And uh, so real ground floor and Dr. Bob Waxlax at St. Cloud State really started the uh, certification of officials and putting on clinics and that kind of thing. And so being young, I, I became an official. But I, 37 years at Shasta High School, two years, three years at St. Cloud State University, uh, coaching, but I was also a registered official. So uh, when we changed to the format at the State High School League, where we had to go on as coaches and we had to go through our deal, like you know, we listened to Dan Dornfield and now we listened to John Pursuant and, and that whole thing at the league, I just went one step further and kept my registration, even though I was coaching, kept my registration as an official. <coughs> and I thought that coach, but at least I was informed um, of the officiating aspect, and I could relate some things to the kids so that they kind of would know the expectation. Not that it was something that was, but it was one more piece that I could relate to a kid. This is what you're going to get. This is what you're going to get, because I know that the meat manager is lefty right and he's got these protocols and I know what you're going to get when you go to the Lake Conference Championships. This is what you're going to get when you're in the Minnesota Championship. This is what you're going to get. Side benefit if you're a coach and you're also a registered official is now you've got your registered official at your meeting. Correct. You know, part, part of the reason for having that registered official is because there's an expectation and I want to encourage you to hold your registered officials to this expectation. So many times they just come and say, well, I'm the starter. And that's all they do. They go down and they set their stuff up and that's, they don't go anywhere else. And yet, because they're your registered official, they are de facto your referee. They're the ones that are supposed to check every vaulting pole at every meet. Every pole is supposed to be checked to be sure the label is correct. 
you are supposed to have the Walters weight verification form filled out, signed by you and your AD at every meet and presented to that official who's checking the polls to be sure that kids' polls match what they're allowed to have. Hold people to that. If starters are supposed to inspect your blocks, have your blocks out for them to inspect. Make sure that they've gone over and double checked your sectors and that they're the right size and all of those kinds of things. That's part of their job. Um, <clears throat> just a couple things. Report on time. Please don't come running over after, you know what I said earlier about 10 heats and the 200. You know what you're doing. I'm over there clerking and everybody and saying, all right, Fire Lake, you're number three kid over here. All right, Egan, you're over here, you're over here, you're over here. Good, you guys are heat five, you got it? Look at your lane number. All right, I'm going to the next one. Heat six, you know how that goes. And we're setting them all up, and just as you finish and you've got exactly 10 heats of eight, here come three more kids. Can we get in? You know I'm gonna let them in, because you want me to, and we wanna get a time on them and all that kind of stuff. So. Get them there, get them where they belong, get them ready to listen. How do they listen? They take off their headphones, they put their earbuds away, they don't have their phones with them. Is there, is there a minimum number of kids in a heat? Does it have to be two or three? You have to have at least two, because yeah. kids have to compete. They're never competing against time, they're always competing against people, that's the idea. Um, uh, I had an experience I've never had before. Kids actually showing up to be court that they had the uniform shorts on. They didn't have the top on, they didn't have shoes, there were spikes on, nothing. And the kid was expecting to change into the spikes at the start line. Please, train your kids to show up at the meet with their stuff on, on. It's actually against the rules to not, to, t to have your uniform top off. Guys like to do that, you know, and it's a hot day in the spring, we're gonna take our uniform top off. No, you're not. You're in the competition area. It's illegal. It's illegal in college, too. You leave your uniform on at all times. I did one thing uh, real quick. Uh, so I'm hosting his outdoor meet, U of M, for high schoolers. And we have a time schedule. So I have fully automatic timing at this. I know exactly what, I know it takes four minutes per section or heat, blah, blah, blah. So I put that over here, the event, how many sections, and then, voila, something came to my mind. You know how we sometimes we say, report to the clerk 15 minutes ahead. I go, put this in your tent. Have your captains carry it in their, in their um, pocket, their warm-up pocket. Report time, specific report time. They all wear their watches, we all. And it just kind of cleared this whole thing up. And as an announcer, if there's somebody in management that says, would you please give first call, second call, third call, final call, it, it, it's more confusing than you could ever imagine. And once you start to overlap all that, <coughs> the kids tune it up. We don't, we don't do one call. One call. One call. When it works. Yep. It works. Um, please don't ask us to teach your kids how to use the blocks <laughs> or any of those other kinds of things. Athletes Which should be able to know how to set the blocks. They should know how to measure their steps for their jumping events. They should know how to set up in their relay exchange zone. If we tell them it's yellow to yellow, they should know what that means. We have to go re go back and explain those pieces to them. Um, we do, um, but it really helps them later in the year if they already know how. So teach the rules of the sports. Like we said, no running in the reverse direction. Don't throw a relay baton up in the air and enjoy down on the ground in disgust because it's against the rules in high school. Keep it in your hand. Running on or over the left side lane line is a violation. How many steps? How many consecutive steps? Three. College? Two. USATF and world? One. Three steps. 
one or both feet. Teach your kids that. Take them out to the track on a curve. I mean, every kid needs it at some point. And start a jog and then move over and run on the line a little bit and say, did you notice what I did? Yeah, that's a disqualification. It's not automatic. An umpire reports it to a referee, a referee makes the decision. A yellow flag is never a disqualification. It's a, uh, something's wrong that I'm going to report, okay? When you're running your intervals, everybody does intervals, even your distance kids do intervals, perfect time. Stay off the inside lane line. There aren't any cones out there today. Yep. Stay off of it, stay out to the outside. True team, stay, I was uh, working one year as a clerk down in that end and they had umpires and this kid came around the corner and he literally ran just right inside that left turn line kind of down by the high jump. Now, the place is teeming with all the kids in the middle of the field and stuff, so nobody at the end can see what happened, but he's got the flag up and it took that kid's team from first to third in the meet by the disqualification for him, taking like nine steps coming around that curve. Um, leave a jump pit going forward, leave a throwing circle going back. Don't leave the throwing circle until the implement is landed. We had a, we had a kid have a, call, a foul called on him at the state meet in the discus, would have been a PR for the kid, but he was so excited he ran out the back of the circle before the discus landed. You have no choice. As an official, you have no choice. You can't say, oh, that was too good a throw, I gotta let that one go. <laughs> when everybody else is looking at you. Um, no pacing. Teach your kids not to run along with their teammates on the inside. If they're in the race, they can pace, but if they're not in the race, they can't. That's my pet peeve with true team. True team where kids literally run all over hell sapping. And they're going side over here, cheer the kid. Then they race back to the other side. And they're sometimes something's bad's <laughs> gonna happen. <laughs> so just some other kind of pieces here that we thought about. Um, we've already talked about that first one. Um, but one thing that, that I was thinking about is that many of you, uh, as, as you um, uh, either are coming into it right out of college or you're hiring people coming out of college to be assistant coaches and so on, remember that there are differences. There are differences. And so uh, making sure that your assistant coaches who are there to coach maybe specific events for you are aware of any differences that exist in the protocols for high school as compared to college. Example, in college, if you want to have any warm-ups after the pole vault has started, you can only have them if you're entering after the competition has been going on for at least an hour, no matter what the height is or anything else. In high school, you can have warm-up time if you have passed three consecutive heights. And you get two minutes on the warm-up. In USATF, you get two minutes, but you're only allowed to take two run-throughs in that two minutes. I mean, they're all a little bit different. So know the, the ones that you have. Yep. We had trouble about, about three years ago at the state true team when we went to 12 teams in the state. And the first year with uh, 12 teams and three athletes, 36 vaulters, and the coaches decided at the meeting a half an hour before the event started that we were gonna start at seven feet and go up by sixes right from the start. So if you passed to eight six, now these are the biggest schools in the state. If you passed to eight six or higher, you got two minutes on the runway. 32 of the 36 kids passed to eight six or higher. So we lost 64 minutes of time because every kid demanded this two minutes of time. The next year, one foot increments until a third of the field is left. <laughs> because meat management saw what they needed to do to make it work, okay? 
using the rules to help yourself. Are there MSHSL mandated protocols? So take a look at those. You're all familiar with the three-in-one rule, right? There's a new rule in high school now that, that uh, states, not the high school league, and not the national, the states can decide if they want to allow kids to enter up to six things, if the state says so. Minnesota has it. But there are states where they will probably allow that. Um, do you believe there are rules that are only supposed to be followed in section and state? Well, there aren't. If it's in the state guidelines, it's expected to be done all year. That's why I brought up the pole vault piece. Do you help show respect to the officials? When you host a meet, are you sure that all your officials are well informed? Are they knowing what they're going to do before they get there? Um, you know, the whole slideshow is on a website that you guys have, so you have access to it. Holler if you want a copy of it, a, a fresh copy, I'll email you one in PowerPoint um, or any of the documents. Um, these are some track and field uh, resources, the high school league pages, the National Federation page, USATF has a whole, it's, it's a massive library of best practices documents. So if you've got somebody new to it, you can maybe print them some things on how to effectively run a high jump. And then you can, they actually make a track and field officials manual published by the National Federation. And if you go to that page, uh, you can get it. Now the first three pages, real quick, of that handout that you have. They asked us to talk about any new rules that came out. That's what these are. So if you take a look at the first page, it says, here are the track and field rules changes for 2024, National Federation. Um, so it says it permits the games committee to set the requirements for each meet. I don't know if you were aware, but the current, not the, not the rule this year, but the previous year's rules, always said you had to have two people on your FAT system. Two. One to run the computer and one to read the picture. I'll bet you you had very few meets where you had two. Most of us didn't. Um, we were breaking the rule. Um, I always hired a company where the owner got himself registered as an official. Because I figured that was sort of my my backup plan, and I would look to that. So you uh, you decide as a games committee whether you want to have two or or just one. It talks about the sixth thing: um, corrected information on track staggers, uh, basically to say we're not going to put in the rule book anymore how long they should be because every track is laid out differently. Um, the whole thing on false starts. Extraneous motion is not necessarily a false start. A lot of kids, when they come up to the set position, they'll settle back a tiny bit. That's really what good starters look for. They know the kids come up quick, settle, and then hold. And your kids should be, when you're practicing, we tell starters 2.1 to 2.4 seconds. <coughs> Somewhere in there. If your holds are getting down to be a second and a half, they're probably a little too quick. So, so work with your kids to understand they've got a hold for that period of time. Did you know that at your mark, when the kid is at their mark, if they are not totally settled, you can have that kid raise their hand, at which time the starter will say everybody up. But the starter has to know that. So prior to the meet, they had, when I was coaching, 57 and change, 400 meter runner for a girl, we'd come back from a rain delay, the track is wet. And I knew at that point in time, I'm looking around and all, I knew I was the only registered official on site. The starter was the former mayor of the town, 30 years doing this, She's not comfortable. Karen, raise your hand. She raises her hand. Starter comes over, everybody up. Miss, you're out. You both started. Because not everybody, well, I'm going, and 
and I can't, I, there's no recourse. There's no protest, there's no nothing. And there you go. The best 400 runner in the state. There it is. But um, just little things, little nuanced things like that. Just a reminder, five, uh, 514, clarify. If your hand touches the hurdle, it's a hurdle infraction. You can't do it. Um, clarifies, when a competitor net enters a vertical jump, let's say your kid passes high jump to the point where there's only two kids left in. So he's coming in when one kid is sort of the sole survivor and he's finally at a height where he's coming in. No, he doesn't get three minutes. For his very first jump, he still only gets the one minute. That's what this is doing. Very first jump in any vertical jump that they take, no matter what, then they're into the three minute thing for the extra rest that they get. Uh, breaking ties. It used to be that they had to be broken in vertical jumps. Now they don't. But you can't, do, you have to do it by procedure. So if you have two kids who have tied in the high jump, same number of misses, same number of, I mean, it's all, everything's exactly, the two of them are left, and they've missed now at that height. So now you go to the jump off where you, one more jump at that height, and then lower the bar, and then do your thing. You go to each kid separately, not together. Each kid, notice I didn't say coach, because it's not the coach's decision, right? Now the kid can confer with the coach, yes. But you go to each kid and you say, do you want to continue, or do you want to say, I'm done? And the kid can say, I'm done. And the other kid could say, I'm done. Then it's a tie. If the first kid says, I'm done, and the second kid says, no, I want to keep going. I want to, I want to jump off. That kid's the winner. That kid's in second place. And this is the way it's now done at college, USATF, the world <coughs> center. And it, it's specifically because there are people who are just, you know, kids only have so many jumps in. You know, what, what, what do they say, six, seven, eight? really good jumps in a day and then they're kind of kind of done. So there's no um, jump, it's just the one that, what's that? There's no jump, it's just the one who says that I'd like to jump up. Yeah, because you've kept them apart from each other. So and, this and, happened at the Olympics and yeah. they asked them both yeah. together. Yep. So yeah. to me, I think it's a disadvantage to ask one kid first and then another kid second. Well, what you could do, is, especially if you've got a good second person with you, is you each go and ask separately and then come back together and say this is what they said. It'll be interesting to see if it happens. I, I probably have only had three jump off situations in the last 15 years that I can think of. Um, the final one here um, for track uh, on the second uh, page it says, permits athletes and throwers to apply tape to their fingers as long as the fingers are not taped together and all can move independently. That's a big change, because you used to not be able to put anything on your hands at all. So now if a kid wants to wrap tape around every single finger, but all those fingers can move independent of one another, so there's no two taped together, or, or a little bit at the bottom or something like that, it's legal in high school. Okay? So I don't know if that helps kids or not. You tell me. I, I'm not a... I stopped coaching throwers in 1973 when the kids ran up to me one day and said, Mr. Utek, you got to get over to the shot put. Hanky just got hit. And he took one off the noggin. And I thought my career was done before it started. And he seemed better, actually. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go into that at all. But that, that impetus from that was that they did give me an assistant coach. I had like 90 junior high kids and it was just me. So, that's a long time ago. You know what, it's, ten, it's after 10 o'clock. We kept you too long. Um, we do encourage questions, write to us. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah, I was just wondering, in the last four or five years, was there anything that you've seen at a meet, you're like, wow, that was a brilliant idea to make things go smoother and more efficiently, that you're like, oh wow, I've never even thought of that. Or this is the first time I've seen something where like a procedure made Uh, one thing that Greg implemented um, early on is at, at the clerking tent when uniform
worked, this is really critical, he assigned a referee to the clerking pen so that we eliminated those, you know, kids, look to your left, look to your right. Are you dressed the same? And I think, I think uniform rule, and that's one of the things, you know, I've seen coaches go to the rule book. No, there is nothing in that, and they're right. There's nothing in that. It's a Minnesota modification. So when you say single, same, solid, color, all of that, that's a Minnesota modification. And so putting that referee at the clerk tent in a very important meet where you don't want mistakes to happen, I think that was one thing that really um, was advantageous to you as coaches and to the kids. I, I, I honestly can't think of one thing, Adam, other than to say um, uh, the biggest thing that, that has worked for me as a meet manager is lots of information. Anything I send to coaches goes to the officials, period. I never let the officials have a coach say, well, they told us this, and I didn't tell the officials that was going to be the case, and vice versa. If officials are being told we're going to do things in a certain way, it's in the procedures for the coaches. And we really, really try to make sure everybody's got all the pieces. What we want at a coaches meeting at a meet is to say literally this. Any questions? And about the only thing we've ever talked about is whether to flip directions. <coughs> and, and that's kind of the way it should be, we hope. We really appreciate you being here. Yes, thank and you so and much. thanks for your attention. And, Use our cards to call and, and send ideas or ask for things. Um, my wife and I have a whole, um, a whole, it's about 10 pages long, but it's about a half a page for every event of kind of real comprehensive clerking directions. Um, if you'd like a copy of that, then you modify it. You modify it to fit your track, your situation, the size of your meat. But I've had a lot of people say they really appreciate that because if they've got somebody new, they've got a guideline. One thing I would do, I would make a sheet up, when you go back to your home track, make a sheet up that says what color are the stagger marks for one turn, two turn, three turn, what color are your exchange zones, do you have one waterfall or two, what lanes are covered, all the different markings. And I would write that up into a chart and then whoever's coming to work your meet, email it to them ahead of time. Who's your registered official that's gonna be your starter? Because one of the things they're gonna have to do is walk the track otherwise. Give it to them ahead of time. It's gonna go smoother. Send that to the teams that are coming so they can tell their kids. Yeah, that's yeah. It. I put it, put it all in there. Mine, put it all in there. The track markings for whichever site. If you're getting a new track and you're going to have it marked, call one of us so that uh, little things, um, the double waterfall that you put three meters back, what I call a walk-up dot, so that the starter doesn't, starter says, assemble at your walk-up dot. That's exactly three meters. Um, make sure your cut line has a curve to it. A straight one is not there. Curved one, line, the curvature of the track is there. <coughs> Putting in, if you plan to hold USATF meets <laughs> at your site, put in the hurdle, put little things on the sideline. Greg and I have done it by hand at Lakeville South so that you know what 80 meters is, 100 meters is, uh, where those hurdles go. If you're going to do something else and you're going to have fun at your meet, and you're gonna put in a 1500, or you're gonna put in a 3K, put that in. If you're gonna use a three-turn stagger for your uh, sprint medley, 2248, put that in. Little things, um, put the uh, uh, double waterfall. So on your top curve, that inside line on an eight-lane track is the outside of lane number four. On a nine-lane track, it's the outside lane of number five. Paint that a different color, not white. Make then we don't have to cone it. We then just you say don't have to cone it. Run on the red line. The kids in the outside alley, you may break to that gold line, as an example.
those kinds of little things really, really help them. I'll leave you with this one. Can you run on a track the way it's marked now, a 200 meter, in the reverse direction so you have the wind at your back? And the answer is, no you can't. Because the staggers are built to take advantage of the cut line on the far side. Correct. And so that's why when you go to colleges, <laughs> you will see that they actually have a second line a little bit apart from that start line that is taking that into account. And if you don't have it, we had a request to do that at a region meet, section meet last year, and I said, no, we can't. Well, you, you can figure out what they're supposed to be. I can. I used to teach math, but I've not done it because I'm not the surveyor that is going to certify that that's the right distance. Yeah. So it's just a little stuff. Yeah, but I, I spent again. a full day with him at Lakeville South with a wheel and measuring tapes, and we did mark 400 meter hurdles for every lane, nine lanes. And let me tell you. We did that, we did that when we didn't have a measure. It was a day. And then the next year when they had the track redone, <laughs> We were off by that much on one, and the rest were right on the north. So, yeah, and he's the math guy. I'm more the, uh, kind of the Thanks. Do you have a holler if thing. you need anything else? Love having you. Love working your meets. Let us know. Thank you. Thanks very much. Where are you from? Where? Back home. Back home? Yes. Okay. I know it's quite lonely. Actually, I don't know him as a I know him because he used to be like a